Eccoci. Tra un minuto si comincia. In a minute we'll begin our final session. So, the late comers come in. The music is, is not part of the meeting. Uh, one minute to go. To go. <clears throat> the survivors, not many really, <laughs> not many survivors. It is usually so. You know, 4.30 4 in the afternoon of Friday. The best, the worst Western customs have arrived to Italy. <laughs> So, Manfred, do you think we can start? Check yes. your watch. Is it 4.15? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good evening. Good evening to everybody, the survivors. This is the final uh, session of this conference. And uh, we have eight speakers who are supposed to summarize the various uh, uh, sessions. And that is... Uh, Time will be very tight. Uh, eight people, five, six min minutes maximum if we want to keep the schedule. Uh, I will try to give a good example. And myself, I will introduce this uh, session with a few minutes. Uh, I've participated to most of the conferences in the past years, as most of you. But this, in my view, this is the most difficult area of discussion, by far. And I will explain why. Because not only because the transformation, the green transition and plus the digital are, of course, pervasive. They, they, they come across and they transform not only the world of labor, but also our lives and even mindset. So we need a holistic approach, as, as it is used uh, to call it. And in fact, the, I've not participated to all of, of the sessions, but judging from the titles, the approach has been, in fact, uh, quite comprehensive. So congratulations to the speakers and to the organizers of the Congress, of the conference. But... But let me uh, make a few points. Uh, why it is uh, particularly difficult for, I think, for other, also for other social sciences, but also for labor law. Because, you know, labor law has been concerned in the past century, well, really not with sustainability. It was not the main focus of, of labor law. But even so, if we consider sustainability, the main focus of labor law was on social sustainability. The economic sustainability was not, not of our business, more or less. It was a business of, of business. And the environmental, ecological sustainability has been completely disregarded. I heard some, ex some indications by the, one of the group. We have uh, marched in two parallel tracks. One, the track of work, labor, production, and one, environment. In fact, this is even euphemistic because they're not parallel tracks, but they are colliding tracks. So the challenge we have is how to uh, focus our, our policy, our regulations on the uh, sustainability, the environmental sustainability, which implies that we have been used more or less to balance, you know, the balance of interest, the interest of productivity, the, inter the interest of equity, of uh, social justice, 
Now, this difficult balancing is, has become even more difficult you have, because you have an inter, intervening factor, which is precisely what to do with the environment, uh, which means uh, we really change the paradigm of production, particularly, uh, we, which we have received from the last century. The in, uh, and the labor law has been shaped along the industrial model, which was consuming the environment, precisely. So we have really to change our mind and approach. And this is not completely clear, clear because some of the policymakers are not particularly in, committed to this. But even when most of us are committed to this idea, but we are tend to believe that this is a sort of easy combination, which is not the case. The just transition, which is uh, what we have to promote, is not easy at all. Look at uh, the reaction, even in Europe, which is considered to be you know, on the forefront of greening. Uh, there, there are very strong reactions by, by whom? By the unions particularly in the sectors, the uh, uh, energy-intensive sectors, which are exactly those which are most affected and which affect more. Therefore, therefore we have to change our approach. And, uh, and you know, the, there is an ILO uh, report, very interesting, it has been mentioned, Greening Enterprises. Yes. I don't know if you've read it. Yes. Well, this is, you call it arousing. In my view, is is anyway provoking. But we have to do the same greening of uh, our instruments and categories. In, please, greening, not greenwashing, which is uh, a very precise distinction. So I think this we are committed to precise to do our research, focus all our research on along these lines towards this objective. In if you want, internalize the reasons of uh, the environment, of climate, in our ideas, objectives, and tools, categories. As I said, not an easy transition. Uh, because uh, uh, it has to be sustainable for the economy, because if we disrupt the production, even if I don't, I don't have a myth of, of great, you know, the, 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 the productivity, but productivity is anyway a prerequisite. And that you have to be compatible with society and with the human being. In fact, I, see, I think we should add to the three dimension of sustainability also the human sustainability. So, uh, employment must be, there must be some greening of employment, which is in a way not uh, impossible because I, I, don't know, I don't know if you, I'm sure you, you have the same data, the ILO forecasts are rather optimistic. The number of displaced jobs vis-a-vis uh, -vis the number of created jobs is one to three. Very optimistic, probably too much. The national plans of recovery Europeans are also rather optimistic, but there is a fact that these jobs will be different from the past in different sectors, in different enterprises, with different skills. So I think we, have, we are facing the most massive uh, phenomenon of mobility and of replacement of capital, uh, instruments, and people, which have not be, we have not been used to. Active labor policies of the past were just uh, small things. Now we have millions of people uh, I remember some, some experts were telling me, reskilling for everybody, upskilling for most. 
which is, which is quite a lot, including uh, the, EU, the European Union action plan indicates 60% uh, of workers every year in continuous learning. 60%. Now the average is 10%. And all adults with basic digital skills. This is a, an effort for our educational system with no precedent. I mean, the precedent was in Italy 70 years ago, we had to fight the uh, illiteracy. Now we have to fight the digital illiteracy. And I, find, I, I conclude uh, with two remarks. Money is not enough. We have a lot of money. I, I mean, we, the rich part of the world in Europe. But money is not enough because you have to change the, the, the institution of, of, of education. Not more education, more of the same. No, not more of the same, more and different. If we, we want to teach to our young people some different work as it is, we cannot tell them the old, what we, we knew in the past. Final and a remark, which is uh, quite new to me. I don't know if you have uh, considered the document, the European document, which is called DNSH, Do Not Significant Harm. This is a document of the Union, the European Union, which comes after uh, the regulation on the uh, basic cluster of future production, and it implies there is a principle which is overriding all activities, public and private, under the recovery plans, etc., next generation, must respect the principle, do not significant harm to the environment, public and private. Uh, and these are very demanding guidelines. Finished. Next uh, uh, discussion and research should be including this. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the list of people who are supposed to give the reports, the first is Susan. Susan, come along. Floor is yours. Five minutes, six. I did not give the really the good example, but, <laughs> but, 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 but you're not supposed to be here. No. Okay, okay. But I, I don't have you in the list. You replace who? Okay, please, Susan. Okay, okay. hello, everybody. I'm Susan Bissom Rapp, and I was a discussant for a panel called Linking Environmental Protection and Employment. The role of law. Our chair was Janice Bellacci, who is magnificent and did a great job with um, a complicated hybrid panel. So the way I saw this panel was an effort to think about two goals that need to be balanced. First, the green transition needs to bring us to environmental sustainability. And yet, on the other side, a second goal is to maintain decent work. We might have to do it through retraining, educating the population with different skills, but we cannot forget that the green transition is going to produce tremendous labor dislocation. So the point of the panel was th to think about law and policy and how it might protect people who labor for a living during the green transition. I had four scholarly works to comment on, and the first had nothing to do with law. It was by Johanna Unterschutz. It was about art, and it was about picturing the local mining industry in the green transition. She starts out in Poland and takes a look at how miners were depicted in the post-war period uh, in the fashion of socialistic realism as heroic figures who would save us all. 
with an industry that we now know is environmentally unsustainable. And she takes us up to the present moment where art is depicting these same workers as facing dangerous conditions and embattled. And indeed, that anchored, for me, the panel because it reminded us to think about human beings as we go through the green transition. So not too much about law, but a good reminder of what we hope law will do. Then we had three papers that dealt with law in very different ways, which for me was a reminder of how many different angles and lenses we can use to think about legal regulation. The second paper that, uh, that I wanted to talk about was by Vincenzo Pietro Giovanni, and uh, Vincenzo recommended radical revision of labor law which he characterized in the present time as extractive in nature. In other words, it siphons off human labor in the same way that the ruling class siphons off natural resources from the earth. And he argues that to replace the present system is a system that he calls generative labor law. And it would enrich and empower labor, which would be an interesting counterbalance in the green transition. But it is a radical project. And he didn't really talk too much, but I think he will once he gets back to the project, about how power, powerful forces aligned in society will prevent the radical transition uh, to the new labor law that he foresees. It is going to be a battle and one that I think we have to cope with. The third paper was by Loïc Le Rouge, and instead of radically transforming labor law, he talks about using existing law, but what he would like to do is to blur the boundaries between occupational health and safety law, environmental law, and public health law with the idea being that we have to focus on a holistic human being who needs health, not only in the workplace, but in society as lar at large. Uh, and, and that echoes a little bit of what Tiziano just said about taking a holistic approach. Except the nice part of this is that the law already exists. Of course, there might be some changes, but we blur the boundaries. My questions had to do with what the regulatory apparatus would look like as we begin to blur those boundaries. And then the very last paper was, about, was by Federico Mucciarelli, and he focused not on workplace law at all, but instead he took a law, look at company law and the fiduciary duties that directors have. And there's a big debate in company law about shifting from director duties being focused on shareholders primarily, so-called shareholder primacy, to instead being focused on stakeholders as well. And the stakeholders could be members of the public, they could be workers, they could be other entities as well. He was relatively skeptical of the ability to do that, and in fact said something that I thought was incredibly helpful. He said, we really need to rely on the state to intervene in different ways. It's not just the fiduciary duties of directors we should focus on, because that would be ceding the authority of the state to private corporations. That's not really what we want to do, because in the end, they would be the entity Done. Yes, finishing? I'm okay. Anyway, those were the four papers. The only thing that I would add is that it's going to be very important as we move forward and craft new law to ensure that, in fact, it is evidence-based, that we have metrics we want to meet, that law is not cosmetic, and that we achieve the results that we set out to achieve. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. You have been almost perfect. Thank you. Ralph. And then Spinelli. Carla, where are you? Okay. Because there are some people with train leaving. Five minutes, six maximum. 
I'm reporting on the uh, panel on the role of industrial relations in the path towards environmental sustainability. I'm standing in for Paolo Borgi, who was the commentator, but he has to leave. So I was the chair, so I'll do this summary of our panel discussions. Uh, we had uh, four papers, but only two uh, speakers turn up. So we were short, and I can be short as well. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, and yeah, the first speaker was um, Constantine Cordello from the University of Federico Due, Napoli, uh, who uh, talked about the involvement of trade unions uh, for sustainable uh, uh, aims. Um, he gave us an overview of um, the legal frame um, by and um, especially uh, concentrating on EU um, uh, provisions and uh, draft directives um, and uh, thereby focusing on an aspect that uh, has been sort of a key aspect in many of the papers in this conference, which is the due diligence. Um, and uh, he was um, relatively um, optimistic that the trade unions um, uh, mentioned in the uh, uh, documents on due diligence do play a role, although uh, there were some setbacks as well as he, as he showed us. In the discussion of his paper, a number of issues were, uh, were raised. One was uh, that um, we should not only think about uh, trade union uh, influence, but uh, other forms of employee representation, of course, uh, in the company um, that take part uh, that and should take part in uh, due diligence reporting, uh, but then the, also the issue of um, of um, going beyond reporting and actually taking part in decision making. Yeah? And uh, a, a question was then also raised: if uh, uh, trade unions uh, are sufficient in uh, representing environmental issues in these. Um, um, discussions inside the corporations, even if there shouldn't be other forms of representation of NGOs and, um, and broader uh, public, uh, and of course specialist uh, um, groups uh, uh, pursuing environmental aims. The second paper was um, uh, by Juan Landa from, uh, from the Basque, uh, University of the Basque Country. Hey. <laughs> we had a discussion about this. So I was, I, 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 um, and uh, he gave us an overview of. Um, so it, it, he asked the question: What implications for collective bargaining uh, in the management of just transitions? And he gave us an overview of uh, um, European uh, uh, works councils and uh, and social dialogues and other forms in which um, um, trade unions and um, workers um, uh, can take part in uh, discussions on uh, just transitions. He was very keen on, in, uh, on the double channel of uh, representation. But um, in the discussion, we, um, we then um, emphasized that, um, again, um, this um, coalition you were talking about between environment and, uh, and labor law um, is to some extent uh, taken up within labor law. One, is one issue was um, occupation and safety and health uh, becoming the internal working environment. So to redefine the, 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 uh, the area of um, Working and uh, of uh, uh, as working environment, and so and of course then the question, uh, and that's an old question, uh, um, how uh, employee representatives take part uh, in decision making in this in this area. So the concluding remark, our our um, panel was called um, um, the role of industrial relations in the path. Um, towards environmental sustainability. What we actually talked about is workplace industrial relations, corporate governance, and in that context, um, how um, employee uh, representatives can take part uh, in bringing about 
uh, economic sus environmental sustainability. All right. That's Thank all. you. Thank you. Uh, sì, eh, eh, Carlo Spinelli. Cinque minuti, sei. Thank you. So I was the discussant in a panel called Rethinking Social Protection Instruments Around the Sustainability Paradigm, and the chair was uh, Cilla Colonai. And there were three panelists, uh, starting from Niklas Selberg. He took us in a theoretical discussion aiming at, at conceptualizing particular problematic and providing some foundations on the matter of the relationship between environmental and labor law, mainly in terms of what kind of interaction, synergies or conflicts can be developed between their regulatory frameworks. And to pursue that purpose, he adopted the inherited classical understanding of labor law as a basis for the discussion to confront them with the aspiration for a shift towards greener production modes. In particular, the paper returned to the classical studies of Hugo Sinsheimer and Otto Kampfreund, creating a dialogue between those and the contemporary need for more sustainable production models. So several paths can be traced from this starting point, and one of them, very important, has been addressed by the two other panelists, Professor Olivier and Professor Florchak, uh, regarding migration due to climate change. Marius Olivier's paper investigates both internal and cross-border displacement, revealing the gaps in the international legal framework, referred in particular to the need of longer-term social protection support. There is, for example, a need to expand the traditional ILO risk categories beyond the classical nine social risks and to acknowledge the risk evident from the concrete experience of persons affected by and forced to move as a result of climate change. Within the framework of internally displaced person, it makes reference to the need for a developmental approach formally endorsed in the UN high-level panel on internal dis displacement and the guidelines regarding the same topic. His paper underlines the important social protection implications resulting from this UN guiding and implementing framework, including the government's responsibility to consider internally displaced persons no more as mere beneficiaries of humanitarian support, largely rendered by non-state actors, but rather as citizens to whom socioeconomic integration should be granted. Isabella Florchak reminded us that uh, if the primary objective of migrants is most often the protection of their life and safety, in the end, they ask for integration into the labor market in order to be able to meet their needs independently. Her paper focused exclusively on the perspective of the host country of climate change induced migrants and the need to prepare strategies for integrating them into the labor market. After recalling three different models of applied strategies and policies for integrating migrants into the labor market, the case considered is that of sudden migration movements caused by climate change, which will have irreversible effects in the short term or will be irreversible at all. And in this respect, the author highlights numerous parallels between the war in Ukraine and the climate change, which has the same irreversible effects in the short term and could be irreversible at all. Therefore, the experience of dealing with the integration of displaced persons from Ukraine can serve as a model solution, Isabella Florchak suggests, for the preparation of climate-related migration policies. And to address this event, the European Union Directive number 55-2001 has been used for the first time after more than 20 years. It represents an adequate strategy, but only for emergency situation, but can help imagining more stable perspectives. So in doing so, the solution adopted regarding um, the um, UK migrants, uh, um, uh, Isabella Florchak says, can serve as both an example and a counterexample of good practice. Regarding the discussion, we just um, had two main uh, reflections to share. On the one side, there are already existing uh, um, positive interactions between uh, environmental law and labor law. For example, regarding uh, greening workplaces, not only because uh, health and safety of the workers is, is it, for certain aspects uh, connected to 
um, in environmental law, but also because there are practices by uh, companies in which both the employers and the employees are involved that um, uh, are, are oriented to greening the workplaces. Uh, for example, more sustainable transport or uh, um, adopting a schedule of work time flexibility or remote work that can help in this direction. And from this point of view, there's another uh, positive example that is one of the South working, as it is well known, the possibility to work from remote for company and multinational companies in areas that are not exactly at the center of the town, that represents an opportunity to develop the territorial uh, as a whole, um, but is, it is necessary in this case that there, is, that there should be a, um, cooperation between local governments and social partners. And in this perspective, another point uh, um, underlined in the, in the session was the important role of the trade unions uh, that need to be involved to uh, uh, help uh, developing uh, sustainable models of productions and also give voice uh, to uh, situations like that of migrants, for example, where they uh, are involved only in uh, informal economy. And regarding uh, the question of uh, climate change induced migration, uh, the main point, the main common concern of Isabella and Marius was indeed uh, uh, how can we manage to um, treat these um, people like uh, citizens and no more like migrants uh, uh, so that they can uh, be, uh, have a free access to the labor market and to the social security system. In this perspective, uh, it was clear that uh, there are international, in, in, there are instruments at the level of international law and even the European law, but they are not sufficient because they do not in, in imply in their scope uh, uh, directly uh, climate change uh, migrants, and uh, they are conceived mainly in a temporary perspective. On the contrary, the um, debates on migration from uh, the policy point of view is mainly um, developed on uh, locking down borders instead of uh, uh, um, um, open them to uh, involve these uh, uh, migrants. And so the role of the scholars is that of uh, going on uh, uh, focusing the, the attention, debating, uh, and even proposing uh, other um, interpretation or new regulation. That's what has been done in this panel and all this conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. Emanuele Menegatti from the University of Bologna. Prego. Thank you very much. So, uh, my, my panel was dedicated to the occupational effects of the green transition and was chaired by Professor Giovanni Solinas. And uh, as it is, it is well known, the climate change and the policies aimed at fighting, at fighting it, uh, they are increasingly affecting, in, involving labor market transformation uh, with an impact on working condition. And that was the specific focus of my panel. And in particular, climate change uh, is uh, uh, directly displacing labor, uh, for example, in sectors that are exposed to heat, such as for agriculture. And uh, uh, the green transition on its side is, uh, in, in, is uh, uh, influencing the labor market, uh, causing perhaps some labor displacement. Uh, for example, we have this huge debate at the European Union level about stopping the production of uh, uh, combustion engine cars, which is going on, and that's about mostly labor displacement. Um, however, uh, the green transition has not received so far the same attention of the digital transformation. This is an argument that came out frequently in our panel, uh, perhaps because uh, the gloomy predictions about the end of work which are associated with the digital revolution cannot be associated to the great transition. As Professor Treu said before, uh, there are some optimistic ILO forecasts about creation of new jobs in the green transition. However, the two transitions, they present indeed many similarities. Uh, Perhaps uh, uh, nor the green transition, uh, uh, neither the green transition nor the digital revolution will uh, uh, involve the end of labor, but they do involve transformation of labor. And uh, 
The target, basically, uh, should be that of preparing workers to the new jobs uh, and pay attention to the working conditions in the new sectors and the new jobs. Um, going to the, moving to the, the panels, uh, the sustainability of the green transition uh, in Colombia was addressed by Ivan Jimenez and Carlos Monroy, and they uh, show how uh, the, this kind of transition can be rather traumatic in, uh, in, uh, in a, a developing country such as Colombia, which is also very peculiar, and uh, can affect the very economic structure of the country. They also express some concern about the um, uh, impact on the informal economy, which is uh, uh, very huge in Colombia. They mention uh, very impressive figures about the informal economy. And they also gave account of um, some proposed reforms uh, in Colombia aimed at improving the working conditions, uh, warning that perhaps those reforms can, can may push even more workers toward in the informal economy, which is a quite realistic statement, but also perhaps quite bold statement which perhaps should involve a need uh, a supplement of reflection um, the positive uh, a positive example on uh, how the green transition can be can be undertaken um, reconnected again to what professor Pereira said before so um, the need to change the paradigm from the industrial economy which is consuming the environment to a new kind of economy so such such a um, transition can be um, can be supported by cooperative companies as uh, Guerreschi and Decca uh, said presenting a case study on Italian cooperative companies and they they show how uh, uh, cooperative companies can um, uh, uh, can lead towards uh, an environmental sustainability, rethinking how we produce and consume and apply the circular logic of the new economy. Um, indeed, cooperation is of paramount importance uh, for addressing climate change, and uh, in this vein, perhaps the cooperative companies themselves can that are able to uh, reconcile the diver divergent interest uh, in in, uh, in the employment relationship between employer and employees, they can help addressing and bring into this new kind of economy. Uh, the importance of preparing new skills was highlighted by uh, uh, Kinga Piworwarska. I absolutely mispronounced the name, sorry for the Polish colleagues. And uh, she focused the attention on, on, uh, on two, two, two points, two issues, uh, reskilling workers, uh, from the, few, uh, the fossil fuel economy to the new jobs in uh, renewable energy and pay attention to the working conditions related to the, to the new jobs. And she mentioned some um, policies, some measures uh, 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 that are present in the uh, Polish labor market uh, that should are supposed to push to help this reskilling of workers. Last but not least, uh, Daniel Hulber investigated the role that social law and labor law can play to uh, prepare for the digital, uh, for the green transition. And in particular, he stressed on the fact that we need to reskill the worker before it's too late. So we need to dedicate the policy, especially to um, training of in-work population rather than unemployed, <laughs> not only unemployed people and so on. And uh, basically to, to have uh, these in work training, uh, we need to provide incentives both to companies and employees. And um, these incentives can come from uh, state funded benefits for sure, but also uh, collective bargaining can help in that, S establishing some funds that can, can, can support the reskilling of people while they are still working for a company so they are not unemployed. And that's it. Thank, thank you, you. <laughs> thank you. Now we, we have Rudiger Krause and then Frank Henry. If you, if we continue like this, we are okay. Please, no, 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 around the corner. Careful. Okay, thank you very much, dear colleagues. Well, the. Um, panel where I was discussing had the title Promoting and 
enforcing environmental standards through um, uh, labor instruments under the excellent chair of Alan Neal. Um, let me start with the last uh, paper from Irina Zopoli from uh, uh, Italy because it comes uh, more, most close, close to the um, title of our panel. Um, she deals with uh, environmental whistleblowing. That means uh, the goal is clear, environmental standards, enhancing environmental so. issues, and the instrument is whistleblowing, a more or less traditional instrument we have in labor law. Starting with um, uh, most recent reform in uh, Italian constitutional law, which puts environmental issues at the um, constitutional level, she brings a lot of details what what is about the future development of whistleblowing law in Italy. Two points, I will only mention one thing that she tries to um, figure out that uh, whistleblowing had to be adjusted to the particularities of environmental issues, that it's not only of uh, restoring uh, environmental um, damages but also preventing that what's going on. And the, the idea uh, that uh, there has to be a particular channels for reporting uh, on environmental issues, that is to use the collective dimension of labor law um, in order to um, remove obstacles uh, and, and disincentives which may arise if employees report on these issues. Um, the other um, papers um, showed us that we have to enlarge and broaden our view in, one, in, in two aspects. The first one is the question, what is sustainability? It's not only about environmental issues, but also about labor issues. It's a, it's a more or less an old old concept. Tiziano Trio, Trio has uh, mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, and uh, Stephen Lee from uh, California has um, well stressed it at the beginning that uh, labor sustainability is can be a concept uh, in order to um, well enlarge our our perception of that what sustainability is. There is a discussion on the question: Is it more than labor standards in a traditional sense? And uh, the answer is uh, maybe a bit equivalent. Um, the second point is the question of the instruments. Uh, it's not only about the traditional label or instrument, but also about the use of other instruments and even also stress that uh, or introduce some instruments from the US or the Californian scene. Um, the Tariff Act of 1930, it's a prohibition of um, um, importation of, of goods which are product, uh, produced with, with coerced work. Um, the, California Transparency and Supply Chain Act, which is a market-driven um, uh, instrument, and the Fair Work, Fair Fair Food Work uh, um, program, uh, launched by um, um, human rights organization, uh, with the goal to s bring some certificates, uh, and uh, uh, in order to well induce um, consumers uh, to buy particular products, which are are uh, um, pr produced uh, without uh, forced work, which are produced uh, fair. We discussed a bit about the uh, advantages and, and, and shortcomings of, of market-driven um, instruments, uh, which may work in particular situations, but of course not in all situations we have. The last two um, papers uh, deal with uh, the question of free trade um, agreements. That is a very, well, let's say, um, a top-down approach on a very international level and the idea to promote uh, labor standards uh, with these instruments. Um, two uh, papers, one from uh, um, Julian Murel from, from Cambridge uh, and the other one from uh, Alexis, oh, sorry, uh, listen, yeah, from Brussels. Um, the one is more analytical on the question, uh, are there particular functions uh, of that um, uh, of that uh, kind of, of mechanism. The other uh, of Alesis, um more with the, the question of occupational safety and health issues, the new generation of EU uh, free trade agreements. And one point is, um, or two points are in that respect remarkable. The first one is, should we focus on the economic, um, well, or should we argue in that, that sense that 
uh, such instrument should have an economic case, or are there uh, do labor standards have their um, uh, their their relevance and their legitimacy on their own? And the second point is, in particular, as regards uh, occupational safe and health issues, is it really a progress uh, to come to a, let's say a top-down approach, or should we? focus more on uh, the things at the ground. So, that was it. Thanks for your attention. Oh, Frank Hendrik and then David Mangan. Mangan. Hello, thank you. I'm going to report about a panel titled The Safety Obligation of the Company over the Internal and External Environment. Mm. which has been led and moderated by Eduardo Ales in a fantastic way. Mm. Um, first paper was from uh, Milena Ruxinol, who talked about the employer's responsibility towards workers with cancer. And that learned us that health and safety law is basically about adapting work to the person. And the interesting thing is that non-discrimination law actually does the same. It also requires reasonable accommodation and by developing her analysis uh, into the European Court on, of the European Union on how disability can be interpreted, she came to the importance of the UN Convention of People with Disabilities and by adding and stressing that reasonable accommodation is the key to keep them employed. Now, one of the things she mentioned is that telework can be the new way of approaching reasonable accommodation at work for people with incapacity to work and it would probably also allow us to more look at their capabilities rather to their incapacity to work. And for us, telework could be one of the forms because reasonable accommodation can be having any meaning as long as we interpret it in a reasonable way. It led us to also to question the voluntariness of telework, which underlies, we know, the telework agreement of 2002, but that may be something to develop further. Second paper, Maria Giovannone, talked about the employer's obligation in light of the new constitutional article 14 in Italy. And she wanted to think about redefining the concept of health and safety law as such. We talked about adapting work to the person, now we talk about adapting work to the planet. And the question is how do we do that? How do we translate, let's say, the prevention principles uh, that we know from health and safety law into a new uh, sort of concept. And one of the suggestions uh, I could do is to say, well, the duty to mitigate is already in the Green Deal. Why do we not translate that into our prevention principles? And perhaps they are already there. Rereading positive law is crucially important, and we would all have agreed on that. The question is, what kind of enforcement strategies then which we know in health and safety law, do we apply and prefer? I mean, we have the criminal law approach of the past and the present. We have the civil tort law approach of the past and the present. Do we also go into collective bargaining, as she suggested? Then we would embrace that. Collective bargaining as a way forward, and also to allow, the, to allow us to say that, well, we need sort of democratic progress in finding solutions for the workplace in uh, meeting the green uh, transition. The third paper from Federica uh, Nizzoli was about uh, looking at both the internal as well as the external uh, responsibilities of companies, but through an integrated risk uh, approach. And risk is an important yeah, notion also to work with in health and safety law. And there is clearly, evidently, a link between the internal and the external environment when addressing health and safety. And risk is an interesting concept because you can wonder who's taking up responsibility for risks. Is that the person who is having a causal relationship with the risk? Or is that the institution that has an impact on something and must take up responsibility for the risks that occur even beyond our own individual control? And that made her reflect about whether we need to sort of reinvent the notion of workplace. Is there, um, yeah, a workplace concept that allows us to encompass also the external dimension of, of the workplace, of work and work organization. And if we look at a workplace away from the time and the space element, even from the material uh, yeah, element of, of uh, workplace, of course, then it's easier to say that the external workplace is becoming under the responsibility of, I would say, 
an OSH strategy, but we also conclude that we may, we may say the o, the o in the OSH should be removed because occupational may have to be replaced by environmental safety and health. So it's ESH. And maybe even better, we look at the World Health Organization. It would say, well, ESH and OSH and USH, whatever, it's well-being at law. And of course, our panel president already launched the idea of well-being before, and we embrace this in a very dynamic way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. As they say, one health. Now we have David uh, Magan. Okay. And then last, Elena. Thank you very much. I had the pleasure of discussing papers in the panel, Rethinking Business and Management Models Around the Sustainability Paradigm. Mm -hmm. It was, as you're not surprised, skillfully managed by Professor Manfred Weiss. And we had the pleasure of three papers uh, that were all set within Italy. And we had a lively discussion uh, about cooperatives as well as developmental performance management systems. With cooperatives, we had two papers. One, Cooperative Work for Sustainable Development from Giulia Colombo from the University of Udine. And the second was Cooperation Among Social Cooperatives from Massimiliano De Falco, also from Udine. Uh, with this lively discussion around cooperatives, there was uh, talk of the success not only in parts of Italy, but also the Basque country, Spain. <laughs> we also considered how developmental performance management systems could be implemented and how these systems addressed how women and those with lower education have been left behind. It focused on the evaluation of people uh, th uh, 360 degree feedback, frequent and constant feedback, as well as employee involvement in goal setting. This was the paper of the need for green skills by uh, four colleagues from this university, Elenia Cruzi, Tommaso Fabri, Filippo Ferrar Ferrarini, and Francesca Nepoti. Uh, the discussion also challenged how this cooperative holistic approach could be deployed and in particular the transferability of these models to other jurisdictions and the viability of these models in a free market system. Thank you. You saved even some minutes. Thank you very much. Elena Sichenko. Did I say it correctly, Sichenko? From Trento. Apparently. <laughs> Thank you very much. First, I would like to use this opportunity to thank uh, the organizers, and particularly Jacopo Senatore, for inviting me. And I was uh, discussing at the session, which was perfectly uh, moderated by Tindara Dabo, which was dedicated to the implications of the green transition on gender equality. We had three papers, and I'm going to go through them quite, quite briefly. The first one was delivered by Matteo Avogaro. It was about the mainstream gender equality in the Green Deal labor perspective. Actually, ah, okay. Uh, it's better like this, sorry. So the first paper was delivered by Matteo Avogaro. It was dedicated to the mainstreaming gender equality in the EU Green Deal, a labor perspective. So actually, Matteo considered how it is possible to, uh, to evaluate the implications of the Green Deal. So what kind of mechanisms, so what kind of indicators could be used? And he, uh, he considered the two of them as EIGE, -E, Gender Impact Assessment Toolkit, and another one which was elaborated by the ILO, ILO Gender Mainstreaming Strategies. And he elaborated uh, three criteria based on which he evaluated those two assessment uh, toolkits. And these criteria were efficacy, versatility, and the difficulty of implementation. And he comes to the conclusion that actually in the end, both solutions, if implemented, would be, uh, would be perfect to assess the EU green funding mechanism because it would, it would be able to contribute for the creation of a more healthy planet and also to a more gender equality at the workplace as well. The second paper was authored by uh, Nina Safi Grimel and Michaela Cela, Celaru, or Celaru. Uh, about the remote working and team motivation consideration for the LMX model. 
LMX model is the leader member exchange theory, which is about the relationships about the management between the management and the workforce, the, the employees. And they had made research about the impact of distant working or remote working on these relationships. And uh, I think also during this conference, we had a chance to understand that it's quite different to be offline and online, particularly yesterday is uh, during the, the, the dinner and today is during the, uh, the lunch. And the girls, they also uh, came to the same conclusion that basically it is the key important, it is key important for, for the um, normal relationship and the atmosphere at the workplace to have offline, uh, offline communication. And it is much more efficient for the workforce. And finally, last but not least, there was a paper with a promising title, Anyone Can Be an Individual, Even a Woman, which was delivered by Julia Jamis. Uh, Julia considered different reports about the impact of green transition on the workplace and uh, um, uh, delivered the argument that it impacts most women as most vulnerable in the, in the workforce. Also, she integrated a couple of sociological aspects, considering not only direct implications, but also indirect implications. So, for example, women are most vulnerable because they might first lose jobs, but also they are vulnerable indirectly, because if, uh, if their husbands or partners lose jobs, they might become the victims of frustrated partners, as uh, the victims of harassment, for example, or other forms of violence. Uh, then she considered that... Um, there should be uh, the. There, it should be understood by the society that something uh, should be done in the field of education because women should be prepared to participate in another uh, in another formation of uh, of labor market and therefore they should develop uh, different skills. And in the, in the present time, there are very little present in the scientific subjects in the university degree. And finally. Uh, finishing with a positive uh, point, uh, the author of the last paper uh, proposes that there, there is a need for a profound cultural revolution. And I think this is a nice point to finish this, uh, this panel. And uh, thank you for your attention. This is it. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I really am grateful to these reports. Uh, very good job, uh, even though time constraints, which I have been pressing on. And now, Manfred, we conclude we, how triumphantly. How uh, wait, take your, take your mic. This is stupid. I'm struggling with technology all day. Uh, well, uh, huh? <laughs> dear colleagues, dear friends, we have heard now so many reports, and we had already a sort of closing remarks by my friend Tiziano, so I can be very brief. I'll try to be as short as possible and make sure that you won't fall asleep. Well, the topic of this year's conference in commemoration of our unforgettable friend Marco Biaci has been the green transition and the quality of work, linkages, implications, and perspectives. Marco would have liked this topic. The green transition is a challenge of utmost importance for the world of work. As I say normally, in a dead world, there will be no jobs, you know, so we should take it seriously. In spite of the fact that the United Nations, the ILO, and the European Union have drawn the attention to the implications for the enterprises, for the workers, for the labor market, and for the social systems as a whole, these implications are still rather neglected by the scholarly disciplines dealing with these matters. Marco was always ahead of time, initiating innovative research on upcoming topics, bringing together interdisciplinary teams, thereby revealing 
the many facets of the problems at stake. In so far, this year's conference has been a wonderful demonstration of the Foundation's efforts to really live up to Marco's legacy. As has become clear in the conference, and as we just heard by these very, very good reports, and I also would like to congratulate the colleagues for keeping time, you know, everybody who knows me, that keeping time is one of my obsessions, you know. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, as we heard by the reports of the discussions, uh, of the discussions of the different sessions, the task ahead of us is more than challenging. It is, it is what you said, you know, to find this kind of balance between environmental, economic, and social, you know, which will be very, very difficult. It's an ambitious concept. As we just heard, the conference has produced many indications on how to proceed in order to reach such a fair balance. Much remains to be done. But undoubtedly, this conference was an important step on the way ahead of us. It not only has led to impressive insights, but it has, as the former conferences here in Modena already did, mainly succeeded in demonstrating the need for interdisciplinary research, and it has <coughs> helped to establish and strengthen networks of scholars of different disciplines. May I say in this context, this of course is only possible if we are here present physically. You know, if you have online uh, uh, presence, virtual presence, it's okay, but it cannot be the same as if we are here uh, physically together and can communicate with each other. Well, this again, the success, you know, in bringing people together fits very well with the legacy of Marco Biaggi. My thanks and congratulations, therefore, go to all of those who have participated in planning and organizing this splendid conference, as well as all of you who have presented their research, have chaired sessions, and participated in the discussions. So we can trust that next year's conference will again bring together research quality of excellence on a topic of similar relevance as this year. We have already discussed on the topic. There is a provisional idea how it could look like, and I only can tell you that it will be as fascinating as the top topic of this year. Now, as I promised, I conclude the conference and wish you a good return home. Until next year. Thank you, Manfred. Thank you to all the participants, to the foundation, Marco Biaggi Foundation, here of the fact that we are here with the 20th International Conference, and then we are thinking of the 21st, it means how the legacy of Marco is with us. Thank you. Good luck.